Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, joins me now. Senator, welcome back to the show. So nice to see you. Let me start with this economy. It's taking flight. No one, no one wants to see a government ground the plane, but here comes Groundhog Day. Republicans say they want concessions in exchange for raising the debt ceiling early next year. The White House says it won't negotiate, and the Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew, can't, quote, foresee any reasonable scenario in which the government can keep paying all the bills past March. Senator, how does this end? Well, hello, Christine. First of all, let's talk about what we just did is we have, I believe, avoided government shutdowns, at least through fiscal year 2015, and that's a good thing. You know, try and bring some certainty to our economy, tr tr try and give some of these agencies and departments and committees in, in, in Congress here the opportunity to rationally prioritize spending. So, you know, we have to return some certainty our, to our economy so it can continue to grow and, and create jobs. But when it comes to the debt ceiling, or, or let's put it another way, when the president comes to Congress asking for the authority to increase the debt burden on our kids and grandkids, you know, I think the American people do expect some additional fiscal reforms mm -hmm. to be enacted at that point. From my standpoint, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start taking a look at this health care law. Taking, hope, hopefully our Democrat colleagues are listening to the pleas of Americans that are, that are begging for relief, that are, that are, at, that are you know, just un, they're unbelieving in terms are of you, how, wait, are how, you how, how the harmful this is. So that, that's you what gonna, I'd like to do. Are you going to tie uh, reforms to the health care law to raising the debt ceiling? Well, that's what I'd like to do. I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what, what type of fiscal reforms, what type of fiscal discipline, what, what kind of, you know, uh, you know, we have to do something. The American people expect us to do something. If we're going to increase the debt burden on our kids and grandkids, we have to do some kind of reforms to make Social Security, Medicare solvent for future generations to, to stop the bankrupting of this nation. So we have to do something. You talk about people crying. You talk about crying for relief from the health care law. But at the same time, you have people crying for relief for a little more time on unemployment benefits. Let's talk about what the bill, the budget bill, doesn't do. It doesn't extend the federal unemployment benefits. 1.3 million Americans are going to lose those benefits at the end of this month. And when you look at the economic data, as I do, Senator, you can see for people newly unemployed, things are getting better. Things really are. For people who've been out of work six months or longer, it's the same old story. And those jobless benefits go right into the economy. Would you support putting more money into jobless benefits here. If you're talking about crying for relief from health care reform, what about crying for relief for the long-term unemployed? Well, let's, let's talk about the health care law's effect on unemployment. You know, the 29ers, the, the people who are now being put into part-time status so that their employers don't have to pay that fine. You know, this health care law is doing a great deal of harm to job creation, but anybody that wants to increase uh, or renew unemployment benefits, you've got to first say, well, what is the lower priority spending item that you're going to, you know, take mm -hmm. off the table? You know, what, what are our areas of the budget are you going to cut to make room for what you consider a higher priority item? So that's the, that's the first table stakes is don't, don't come in and request some more government f spending without showing us how you're going to reduce the deficit in another area. Clearly a lot of prioritizing to go for the next couple of years. You know, on, this, on this show, sir, we talk about one America, but two economies. Anger over income inequality, anger over a lack of a living, living wage. It, it's really on the rise. I want you to listen to the liberal comedian Bill Maher, and then I want to give you a chance to respond. When even working people can't make enough to live, they take money from the government in the form of food stamps, school lunches, housing assistance, daycare. This is the welfare that conservatives hate. But they never stopped to think, if we raised the minimum wage and forced McDonald's and Walmart to pay their employees enough to eat, we, the taxpayers, wouldn't have to pick up the slack. I gotta ask you, does Bill Maher have a point? No, when you raise the minimum wage, you remove those entry-level positions, you, you, you create more unemployment, and that's not a good thing. What you need to do is you need to actually make the manufacturing base of this country more robust. How do you do that? You make America an attractive place for business in investment, business expansion, job creation. We have an onerous regulatory environment in this, in this country. Obamacare is part of that. We have uncompetitive tax rates. I mean, if you're a German manufacturer want to manufacture for the largest economy in the world, are you going to site your plant in Toronto at 15%? or Detroit at 35%. So it's not rocket science in terms of what we have to do to make America an attractive place for job creation. We're just not doing it in this totally dysfunctional place called the federal government. Well, at least we have a frameworks of a budget deal for the next couple of years. We'll take that as a nice starting point. Thank that, you, that, sir. That's a small little step. <laughs> have a Merry Christmas. You too. Thank you so much.